Hi, this is Jessica DeMoss, and I'm in the Guidewell Insights Lounge here at Singularity University's Exponential Medicine 2017. I'm here with a very special guest. This is Mr. Peter Diamandis, who is the co-founder and executive chairman of Singularity University and Exponential Medicine. And I understand you've brought a special guest with you I for have, us. I have, in fact, very proud to introduce Dr. Bob Hurry. Uh, Bob is uh, MD, PhD, uh, a military fighter pilot, uh, has a fleet of jets, entrepreneur, scientist, uh, one of the uh, team members who co-founded the tumor necrosis factor. Uh, but mostly, Bob, uh, I know you as one of the stem cell pioneers. 25 years ago, you recognized the power of stem cells when you were a neurosurgeon focusing on head trauma and spinal cord injuries. And stem cells, we've heard about stem cells, and but I think we've described that stem cells are just now coming into their own. So what is, what is the stem cell, the power of the stem cell? Why are you so excited about it now? So, uh, first of all, Peter, I'm just so <laughs> glad that I'm here with you, Peter. Aww. So, Peter and I go back a long ways, and, and he, has, he has been a uh, uh, tremendous inspiration and part of the entire journey of turning living cells into medicine. So, Peter is absolutely correct. The term stem cell has been in the vernacular, people understand it, for two decades. The process of taking this breakthrough technology from the bench to the bedside to commercialization has been a long, arduous journey, in part because it's such a complex and, and, and unique tool that both the industry, the regulators, and the, and the, the consumer are just beginning to be very comfortable with the long track record of safety and activity. So our job has been to productize living cells, literally put a living cell in a vial and allow a doctor to administer it just like a pharmaceutical. Like inject it into you and have that living cell forced into your bloodstream, not one cell, but millions of cells, right? That's right, millions of cells acting in some ways in an orchestrated fashion to drive processes that stimulate repair and recovery in our tissues and organs that are affected by disease. Now, the reality is cellular medicine has been around a long time. Transfusion, taking blood from one donor and putting it into a recipient is a form of cellular medicine. So to the clinical community, there's an intuitive, there's a logical nature behind this, people understand. But for us, using the biology of the cells to, for example, control the immune system in autoimmune disease, or to turn on and stimulate the growth of new blood vessels, that's a novel concept that has taken quite a while to both provide the clinical and scientific evidence and demonstrate that you can actually do this on a scale that's meaningful for medicine. And that's what I've spent the last 20 years doing, first building a company that recovered the source material, and the source material is the leftover placenta after a full-term healthy pregnancy, then derivatizing or extracting the cells and other things from that organ, and then turning those cells into a product that could be delivered at a dose and through a mode of administration like intravenous or direct local injection so that they could affect their biological activities on the patient. So Bob, let me, let me just uh, uh, take this a, a step at a time for, for the audience watching us. Uh, first of all, what is a stem cell? A stem cell is a specific form of a, of a living cell that has retained all of its versatility, all of its ability to, to divide and differentiate into specialized cell types of the body. So we all start out as a single cell. That cell undergoes division, making, giving rise to new cells, and some of those cells actually mature into different forms. Mm -hmm. So a stem cell can be thought of as a master, undifferentiated form that retains the ability to choose its direction. Become any, any of the cells required to form a human. Exactly, so remember, a human being is made up of trillions of cells. All those cells came from a single cell. So during the way, some of those cells divided and became brain cells, some of those cells divided and became heart cells, some divided and became bone cells. Believe it or not, that process starts at the moment of conception, the incident of conception, and continues throughout our life. Believe it or not, even after death, some of the cells in your body continue to divide and differentiate. Amazing. 
Well, so, Bob, uh, one of the things that you discovered was the fact that the placenta, uh, which which I, I call the 3D printer that manufactures the baby inside. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> I love that. The, the, the placenta is the richest form, uh, richest source of of stem cells. And you built a company that today, LifeBank, has banked seventy thousand placentas, including. For my two boys, we're now six years old. Can you talk about the power of the placenta and what it means? So, we first embarked on this going after the known cells left over at birth from the umbilical cord blood, all of which come from the placenta. And then we learned that, that even the cells resident in the organ that was gonna be disposed of had value. And so we began to process and bank those cells and develop them as therapeutic products. What's unique about the placenta is it is, it is nature's professional graft material, meaning the placenta is designed to be transportable, transplantable into a recipient without having to match the donor and recipient. Which is, which is amazing, right? We, all we hear about when I have an organ transplant and the organ's rejected. Right. And you're saying that, that the stem cells coming from a placenta don't have to be matched. It's one size fits all. So think about yes. this, right? The placenta is made by the developing fetus, mm -hmm. and it resides inside a mother that's only 50% matched to that child, and she doesn't reject it, it doesn't reject her. Consider surrogate pregnancy, where a, where a mother carries a fetus she's not even related to, and she doesn't reject it. That unique immuno, immunologic relationship between the mother and the fetus, and the mother and the placenta, is conserved in those cells. So we've treated hundreds and hundreds of patients with placental cells. We never had to match the cells to the, to the patient. That's a remarkably powerful tool. But it's also powerful because if we can harness that immunologic control, we can get a handle on things like autoimmune disease, Crohn's disease, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera. So How, the, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry, I was just saying, what's really curious to me is you had said you inject them. How do they know where to go? How do they know what to do? That's a fantastic question. You know what? I often say nature is a lot smarter than we are. Stem cells are designed to traffic to their site of residence through the circulatory system, and they find out where to go based upon signaling that may be the result of inflammation. It may simply be the result of cells having to go and renew or repair something. So I often tell people this. We're made up of trillions of cells. The vast majority of those cells are less than two years of age, meaning that they are recently the product of a differentiation step into a mature form. But what continues to maintain our health and the way we look as we age is this constant renewal and renovation that's driven by stem cells. Stem cells know what to do based upon where they wind up. So a stem cell from your bone marrow that traffics through your bloodstream and winds up in your liver becomes a liver cell. How quickly does that happen? Is that instantaneous or? So the process is very fast. How you, describe, how you define instantaneous. For example, um, when you're injured, mm -hmm. when you're injured, the injury signal goes to places like your bone marrow and recruits the expansion of stem cells, their migration into the circulation. Help. We need help over here. <laughs> we need help, it's a, it's a help signal. And your bone marrow actually produces cells that traffic to your body. By the way, you know, one of the theories we have is that, that there's a use it or lose it phenomenon in stem cells, right? Calling upon the reservoir of stem cells to expand and divide and traffic is probably a good thing. It may even be the reason that for centuries, old doctors were bloodletting. Right? Ah. When, you, when you actually bleed someone, you actually stimulate their bone marrow to expand. That actually might have health benefits. Scott, let me, um, uh, you're going to be announcing uh, a new company uh, next month that is... We're going to be announcing. Yeah, we're uh, going to be announcing. Thank you. Yeah, I'm very excited about that. You're the chairman and CEO, pal. I'm, I'm your... Uh, <laughs> uh, wingman. Some, wingman, exactly. Yeah. Um, but it's really a culmination of uh, over 20 years of your work. Let me just take a second and talk about the potential of stem cells. Um, uh, it's like, the, what, could, what can stem cells do for humanity, for humans in the future? Because it's pretty extraordinary, right? So can you talk about sort of the, the, big, the big picture ideas of, of uh, uh, providing the right stem cells back to humans? Uh, what is that, what's the potential? 
So from my vantage point, and I've been in this a long time, I see stem cells as one of the most powerful, most logical, and most, and most economical ways to restore the natural regenerative engine that keeps us young and healthy. So what's the objective of medicine, right? Medicine is about restoring and preserving health. What's health? Health is the absence of disease. So a couple of things here. In order for you to not have disease, if you have disease, you have to eradicate that somehow. So stem cells are gonna find their way into things like immunotherapeutic tools to go hunt down your cancer. We're already doing that now. We're taking stem cells, we're growing immune cells from them, and we're using those immune cells to target cancer. But it's also the way we do things like repair fractured bone, the way we repair degenerated muscle, the way we restore brain function in someone who's had a neurologic injury. These cells have the potential to go back and drive the natural regenerative process that restores functionality, restores a youthful phenotype. And what phenotype means is, is the form, the youthful form. And by doing so, you've not only restored health, but you've actually restored um, youthful health. I, I like, you, I'm going to quote Dr. Robert Ferreri here. Uh, <laughs> you talk about the potential for it to rejuvenate uh, the aesthetic, uh, the cognition and the mobility, right? right. Looking good, thinking good, and moving well which is really what, what youth is about. I mean, the way we think about it, healthy longevity is preservation of high-performance cognition, yeah. right? High-performance mobility and high-performance aesthetics. Those three things combine to create a youthful form that's competitive, right? Can compete in your family, can compete in your society. That's actually the goal of everyone who is interested in improving the quality of every year we add. Let's face it, in the last 110 years, we've doubled lifespan in, in, among humans. Doubled lifespan. We've done that by going after causes of premature death. We're getting better and better and better at that. Now, you don't want to add any years where you haven't maintained the quality and the performance of that individual. That's where I think cellular medicine has one of its richest opportunities. Uh, you and I were co-founders along with, with Craig Venter uh, of human longevity. And uh, in one sense, human longevity's mission was to prevent someone from dying from something stupid. Like uh, scanning you every right. year and making sure that there's nothing going on, that your genomics, that your, your full body phenotype data is all there. Uh, but it's, uh, HLI's mission was not to uh, rejuvenate your body, but that is where we're going with, with stem cell applications. And just to be clear, to boil it down, the potential of stem cells, as you know, uh, as I hear you uh, speak about it in the research that you've been doing, is number one the potential to extend the healthy human lifespan. Can you talk us in in, in uh, animal models when you're giving back their placental stem cells to them? Uh, what are you seeing in terms of extended life? So. You know, Peter, I've been intrigued by this for 35 years. I published a paper 35 years ago where I didn't, I wasn't chasing anything about age-related disease, but I was looking at how blood vessels um, develop vascular disease, atherosclerosis. And I started transplanting blood vessels from old animals into young and vice versa. And what I found was that if I put an old blood vessel in a young animal, that blood vessel transformed into a youthful form. I didn't know what was going on at the time. Today, I recognize that, that you have the ability to reprogram old tissues, organs, simply by being in the presence of these young stem cells. So, we went and chased this down a little bit. We said that stem cells decline with age. Can I boost them up? Can I augment your stem cells by giving you exogenous stem cells? So in animal models, we gave animals doses of their own stem cells collected at birth as they age, and those animals lived 40% longer than their litter mates. Amazing, huh? So it was astounding, right? More importantly, they were bigger, they were stronger, they beat the little animals up. So, <laughs> so, you, know, so, so you know, what that basically told us was that here's a very, you know, in medical terms, right, in, in operational terms, it's a very simple thing to do, right? I mean, if you go to the doctor and you can get a, a boost of your stem cell reservoir, with your own cells or with cells that are compatible. Isn't that a really straightforward way to address some of the things which are leading to your degenerative diseases? I think it is, and by the way, 
It's happening today. Plastic surgeons, they'll, they'll say it was absolutely by design. It may have been by just good luck. And I'm a, I'm a big, I believe in luck. luck luck's as important as anything else. They started transplanting cells that were recovered from liposuction material into the face. Initially, they thought that they were going to use this to augment the, the bulk and the contour of the skin. And what they found was the skin actually improved in quality. Well, it turns out that the reason it improved in quality is they were unknowingly administering stem cells from the liposuction material into the face. And those cells restored the functionality of the skin, mm -hmm. and that transform that actually was, was manifest in a youthful appearance. Well, if it works in skin, it? it's going to work everywhere. Is this the beginning of us moving toward living forever? So, you know what? It's a good question. I mean, living forever is one of those abstract right. concepts no, for me. But, but I do think... I, I do mean, think, it's so phenomenal. I, just... I do think that living to 100 and having a highly high-performance, highly productive uh, uh, life to, to that age is possible. So, Peter and I are, are aviators. We fly. Okay. okay? Um, I've been flying longer than I've done anything in my life. You know why aviation is so incredibly safe? Because the machine, the airplane, and the human being is a machine, that airplane undergoes a continuous process of renovation and repair. Most of it is done uh, proactively. Okay? We have something called the, the Manufactured Suggested Maintenance Program, right? Where we actually go, we replace parts before they ever wear out. In humans, human medicine is a reactive science. We don't replace anything until it's already broken. Okay. What happens if we have tools that allow us to actually replace something before it goes bad? What does that mean for our performance? I can tell you, in orthopedics, you can assure yourself that it'll, it'll, it'll maintain a level of mobility that we've never seen before. If we can do it in the brain, if we can do it in the heart, if we can do it in other organ systems, I think that's the key to living to, let's say, 100 and being as active at 95 as you were when you were 45. That's the goal. Amazing, and, and I've seen in the facilities around the world that are using mesenchymal stem cells, not using placental stem cells yet, but I've seen uh, indications where people are getting stem cell uh, infusions, IV, 120 million cells, and this is increasing their muscle mass, it's increasing okay. the vitality, it is, right. uh, they're in children with autism, having an impact on that, people with spinal cord injuries, um, people with uh, autoimmune disease from Crohn's to all kinds of things. I mean, it's, it's pretty spectacular uh, what happens when you rejuvenate the regenerative engine of the body. It gets a chance to heal itself. Consider that most of our approved, accepted approaches to treating disease come with a lot of baggage, right? Comes with side effects baggage, adverse effect baggage, and so on. What we're finding with cellular medicine, and there's a lot of work to be done, don't get me wrong, we have to work in complete partnership with the FDA, EMEA, and so on, agencies that kind of, kind of hold us to a very high standard. We have to be able to demonstrate that, this, that these products are intrinsically safe, okay? They can be administered easily with very low risk of side effects and can transform the system from a, from a dysfunctional, abnormal state to a state that is far more functional, more approaching normalcy. If we do that, these products could wind up being used routinely in a preventative maintenance program. I actually believe we're coming to a time, there's two things. Our genomics company is giving me the master warning, master caution button that I have in my cockpit glare shield, okay? Yeah. The reason I don't have problems when I fly is that my system tells me when something's going wrong. Right. We can do that in the body too, using things like genomics, molecular analytics. And we now have a ability to replace and preemptively things that are going to go bad with something like a cellular medicine product. Uh, my last question for you, Pal, is uh, uh, 20 odd years ago, you actually came up with the idea and patented the idea of regrowing organs. Regrowing organs from stem cells. Can yeah. you talk about that one? I mean, it's pretty amazing. Right? Yeah, can can no, you imagine no. having an extra set of of lungs, liver, waiting, kidney, waiting, heart, yeah. on, on like frozen, waiting for you. No, this is unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, off this the is shelf, true right off the shelf. Well, oh, listen, okay. as a surgeon, I'll tell you, most of my surgeon buddies and colleagues will tell you, you know what, <laughs> if I had off the shelf replacement parts, I could do things and send people home 
faster, quicker, with better repairs than if I had to wait for things to go wrong. So here's what we came up with. I'm an engineer by trading, okay? A long time ago, when I sat and looked at the concept of replacement parts, I said, what is an organ? What's an organ? What's an organ? An organ is a three-dimensional structure that's populated with cells, okay? The assembly and the layout of those cells is very specific, okay? But if you just follow that simple set of, 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 of uh, standards, you could conceive of building an organ by, by having a template. The template is the organ's structure. Okay. And the, just, the collagen structure fluid, right? It, it's, 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 it's more than just collagen, but it is structural proteins. Sure. Every organ is a scaffold, a three-dimensional scaffold, and cells populating the scaffold. I figured out a way 20 years ago to take an organ from a, from a cadaver, remove all the cells, De decellularize. decellularize it, leave behind the three-dimensional architecture along with all of the three-dimensional characteristics necessary to, to inform those cells what to do. And then if you repopulate it with cells, the cells take up residence. You mean put, the, put that structure in a bath of stem cells? Put, put, this, put the organ in a bioreactor, okay. infuse in stem cells, they wind up trafficking taking up residence and remodeling the organ. Wow. And our good friend, Martine Rothblatt, a hero to both of us. She's the CEO of United Therapeutics. Has done remarkable work in, in creating the team that's taking some of our early nascent work and reducing it to practice. And, Mart and we're working closely with Martine in order to make that a reality. And it requires that kind of vision and that kind of steadfast intellectual, financial, and, and, and resource commitment. And so United Therapeutics is right now working to build off-the-shelf organs to replace those that are affected by disease. Incredible. That proof of principle, that proof of concept will allow us to do this in pretty much every system. It's fantastic. Thank Amazing. you guys so much for joining me. Peter, Bob, Pleasure. best of luck with your new Thank business you. endeavor. This is just a, an you. unbelievable advance in medicine. Thank you so much for stopping by to share no, it with no, us we're here. We're excited to roll Thank this you. out. No, no very no. nice. Thank you guys so much. I'm Jessica DeMassa here at the Guidewell Insights Lounge. You heard it here first at Singularity University's Exponential Medicine 2017. Thank you.